Hello everyone and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nishjad Zathuryan. I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. My guest today is Victoria Khechumyan, the CEO of Noor. Noor is a blockchain consulting and advisory company. We spoke about building up the Armenian blockchain ecosystem, how to validate blockchain product ideas, and what current trends Victoria is excited about in Web 3.0. Thank you for listening. Victoria, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Nishte. Thanks for inviting and for having me today. Thanks for being here. Victoria, let's start with a little bit of your your background. Can you tell us how you got started in the industry and what got you interested in blockchain? Sure. So the interest in crypto started back in 2016, 17, uh, when the market was really active. And I was like, okay, I need to understand a little bit more about this technology, about bitcoins and um, dig deeper to, to see what's happening and what can I do here? Because um, I, I was already involved in tech sphere um, and I wanted to understand what the future holds for this uh, technology for blockchain specifically and uh, the applications and in 2018 um, I joined Noor before that I had my startup I was working with a famous arm tap company uh, back when I just started my career in IT sphere and in 2018 in June when I joined um, Noor as uh, chief operations officer, uh, the journey started, the, the real journey started, let's say. And uh, at that moment, I would like to s- spread some light also what Noor was doing and how we got to this point. Uh, Noor was founded in 2017 as Armenian Blockchain um, Association. And the founder, Vigen Arushanyan, had uh, this passion uh, to put Armenia on the map of uh, blockchain ecosystem. Because at that time, the blockchain uh, products were growing, different companies were, um, were getting active in the sphere, and uh, the crypto market was growing as well, and everyone was interested. But nothing was happening in our country. Um, so at that time, uh, the founder, Vigen, he decided to bring all this uh, experience, um, all the enthusiasm into our market to start building here and to make Armenia another like crypto hub or blockchain mm-hmm. hub, let's say. The main purpose and aim of Noor at that time was um, to raise awareness about the technology because we start from there. If, if you do not know about the technology, if you do not know about the market, uh, nothing can be built as it is. Um, so we started from scratch and uh, we were providing um, consulting, doing seminars, uh, talking with different people um, and uh, trying to build a community around the technology. There was no uh, certain model we were following. It was adjusting to the market as it came. And we had a st- some certain areas of focus. So as I mentioned, raising awareness and education itself to build the capacity here, the talent. Uh, the other one was uh, policy advocacy. So what's happening in the regulatory um atmosphere, environment, and we were trying to understand how this can be regulated. Do we need to regulate anything? So we started to work with stakeholders, uh, with government, Central Bank of Armenia to understand what can be done. Um, I'll bring some more examples later uh, where we got with Mm -hmm. this point. Um, Also, we were working actively with um, international players, Um, let's say players in, in the market abroad. Um, and we developed a network of uh, more than 50 partners in more than 50 countries. So um, a big one at that moment. Because uh, So what we were trying to do, um, experience exchange, uh, trying to understand what, ca- what we can share and what we can uh, receive from the stakeholders who have been in the market so far uh, for some time, and, and community building. Mm-hmm. So four four pillars yeah. uh, and we were very actively working on that until 2019 2020 um, until the COVID came coming back to um, education raising awareness and building talent 
uh, we had the chance uh, to build our own courses, our own trainings based on the needs of the market. And uh, the courses were specified and targeted not only for non-tech people, but also for engineers. And we had the chance to uh, drive a couple of courses and to, to start building this talent and community. And uh, we um, had success on placing these people or creating the environment for them, themselves to find jobs or to be recruited or to find uh, companies they, they can work with. Uh, we also worked with academia very tightly uh, here locally and also with prominent academies abroad. At that time, University of Nicosia was one of the first um, universities who had master's degree in crypto and digital assets, let's say. And uh, we had a partnership with them and we tried to bring their experience here and also designed our own course for um, our universities and we had the first the first time in the region let's say we had a chance to build a course with um, university Yerevan State University for master's course in data science and uh, blockchain was involved um, as a separate um, topic uh, for for that course so it was a technical course uh, not technical generally fundamentals mm -hmm. of blockchain and crypto but um, it was f huge at that time because it was the f one of the first ones. Um, and uh, we still have the partnership with with the university. So uh, whenever we have the interest and whenever we have the buy-in from, from the students, uh, we have the designed course and we will run it again. And it was back in 2020 uh, mm -hmm. at that time. Other than that, we provide trainings for corporates, for teams, uh, workshops. Uh, back in 2018, we ran a workshop uh, for World Bank Armenia. Starting from that time, there was a huge interest to understand what the technology is and what they should look into. Uh, and they wanted the team to be aware what's coming next. Now, regarding the education and um, raising awareness part, we still keep the same pace. Uh, but the community is more active, so oh. we have some more stakeholders and more players here. And we continue doing the courses, we continue, we have scaled the trainings, so it's not just locally now. Uh, we have uh, clients and partners abroad, um, so it, it, it's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. And you, you will ask why, because um, at that time um, it was just, we knew we need to do this. Uh, because people need to learn to understand and to start doing something here to scale the uh, technology, to adapt the technology. But now people are uh, seeing they are already missing the train and they need uh, to run faster. Right, uh, upon the to, train. Yeah. yeah. Um, now we, we are receiving more requests than just going and telling, mm -hmm. oh, let's do it. And other thing is you cannot just, no, okay, you will learn some basics about crypto and blockchain, but if you try to uh, apply something or use the technology or use the applications, uh, you need to truly understand do's and don'ts, right. just as a user, not even someone who works in, in the sphere. Other than that, um, coming back to policy advocacy, back in 2018-19, uh, we saw lots of countries, lots of governments, having uh, and central banks having research groups, research labs, focus groups who were um, researching the technology, understanding what's going on, uh, what is happening, how we can still have our hands on that. And we understood that uh, we need to try uh, to bring our own solution here as well. And we have uh, developed a research group here uh, with the team of NUR and with stakeholders from uh, government, from uh, the Ministry of Economy, also Central Bank. And uh, we have developed a project like kind of law for crypto regulation. And the law, uh, this project was proposed and announced uh, during Chainpoint 2019. This is one of our events, annual events we're organizing, but it still stays on paper. So 
the policy? The policy itself. Mm -hmm. um, because what we're seeing, we will still need more use cases that will leverage that policy, that piece of law or regulation or whatever. We do not have the use cases locally here. Uh, so the market um, operates as it is. Mm -hmm. So What were the details of that policy? What was it trying to regulate? Crypto as it is. So what what is crypto? What, what needs... Um, so how we define it. Hmm. Uh, okay. In more established ecosystems or countries, how is crypto defined today? And how does it differ from how it's defined in Armenia? It depends. Uh, for some some um, countries, it, de it is defined as commodity, mm -hmm. as, as an asset. So And the regulations uh, differ um, starting from that point. And it, it also, if we look at the current uh, state of the regulatory system, we can prove that back in 2019, we got to the right conclusion on waiting for the use cases because now and exactly in 2022, we have seen a very rapid change uh, on different major stakeholders collapsing, going bankrupt mm -hmm. or um, following not the pace we were expecting them, expecting them to follow. And right now, the, the governments, uh, the, the stakeholders who are responsible for um, suggesting the policy or any kind of laws, they are getting active. Right. So, and that's the time to, to do something because the market is waiting for it. Market, customers, users, investors. Right. Earlier when you said it wasn't the right time in 2018, 2019, because there wasn't the activity yet, in Armenia... By activity, do you mean the um, existence of, for instance, current cryptocurrency exchanges in the country or just people using cryptocurrencies for transactions or, or for investing or selling cryptocurrency assets? Or? It's both. So looking from the perspective of players, exchanges, other stakeholders uh, who provide services and products in uh, in crypto and from, from customer and user uh, perspective as well. So it targets both. Mm -hmm. right. uh, what, what should be our action items or what should be the general rule of operating? It's, it's not covered uh, for now. So uh, we operate as it comes and we make the decisions as it comes. Right. Uh, is there enough activity in Armenia today to warrant regulation or are we still not there yet? Um, I think we're not still uh, there but yeah. um, the doors are open. Whenever we see that, okay, we need uh, to put that tick mm -hmm. uh, and it will bring uh, more added value and it will have m huge impact, uh, we have everything ready for that. So we have done the prep work. Right. Recently on the podcast, we had a consultant from McKinsey and they were speaking about how Armenia needs to position itself as the best in something, um, the best place in the world to do this this one thing. So I think some of the examples he brought were um, Switzerland is known for its banking. Other countries might be known for some subsector uh, in technologies, even for different domains of the technology. And, uh, one of the examples he brought was maybe Armenia needs to position itself as sort of a global place for blockchain, let's say. Uh, he just brought it as an example. From a regulatory perspective or from a policy perspective, is there something that Armenia should be doing even before there's that activity to attract global players uh, to the ecosystem here? It's general doing business. So it's not uh, blockchain specific, but general how we do doing business in Armenia, hmm. how we... Uh, what do we offer to the uh, players from abroad, uh, from for international players, and what kind of environment we have for them? Blockchain is has no borders, so right. blockchain and crypto has no borders. So it's more about the the operational part, the teams who are building mm -hmm. everything in blockchain and crypto. So what do they do in Armenia, and what? do we as a country offer to these teams, right. startups, etc. Right. To give some positive note here, with recent uh, developments in our region, we have seen lots of startups uh, from Ukraine, Russia, and other countries uh, coming here. Um, and I do believe uh, we, have, we still have the environment ready for them to set up shop here. Yeah, yeah. to set up here. I want to backtrack a little bit to the community building aspects that you guys work on. Over the last year that we've been doing this podcast, we've spoken to a few people who've been a part of 
the really early days of, let's say, machine learning in Armenia or other technologies. And it's always interesting to see how you, as you put it, start from scratch when trying to create an ecosystem uh, in the country. For instance, in the future, perhaps someone will be doing it for quantum computing technology or something. What are some lessons you guys learned along the way for for building the ecosystem from scratch? And particularly, as you're introducing the technology, as you're teaching more people about it, what needs to happen in order for it to sort of take off and really turn into an ecosystem that's sort of more sustainable? An interesting question. Yeah. So um, back in 2017, when we started, we already had some players in the market who were providing services and products, not locally, but to international market. Aram Jivanyan, everyone knows uh, knows him. He was one of the, still he is a great cryptographist and he had provided an open source solutions for uh, Lelantus, for uh, Zcoin, now Firo. Um, and it was back then. And we had a team who was working on a um, solution called Descent, still back in 2015 very, very early stage. And in 2015, in 2017, when we when we started, uh, we started with seminars, workshops, uh, we were trying to understand, doing the mapping, okay, who, who are the people now? And what do what does the market need now? And uh, we started just talking to those people and understand what kind of capacity we're trying to build. Okay, we're, we're trying to build the community. It's it's one one area. We're trying to build talent. So what would be the, the capacities we're trying to target and uh, why? Mm-hmm. Uh, we started with um, checking the models that we had abroad with other partners, how they did it, uh, how the community started growing and around what the community uh, gathered, let's say. So everyone. So the first thing is everyone is interested in holding Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin. So it's it's more about cryptocurrencies themselves, investing, and yeah. yeah, investing, trading, etc. But um, our own focus and will was uh, to raise awareness about the blockchain technology itself, because cryptocurrencies are application of this technology. Right. It, it's big and huge application. But the reason we have cryptocurrencies and the cryptocurrencies exist uh, is the blockchain technology. Um, We started to see a pattern uh, of companies growing. So we we noticed uh, we're having new teams developing and we have new companies uh, getting into the market. And that was the time when we understood, um, okay, we need to get uh, all together to have a common goal, a common objective on uh, developing the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we still uh, do this all together with our partners and community members. And um, at some point in 2019, so one of one of the other um, aspects and areas uh, that was very important for the community, we did our first conference in 2018, and it was an international conference. So this is uh, NUR's annual event that we're doing every year. Uh, last time we did 2019, and we're coming back in 2023. 20, nice. Um, so. We invited, um, in 2018, we had people from 40 countries, two days networking, like top tier companies uh, present, sharing their experience. And we have noticed that people are uh, more interested uh, to get into the community, to get into the, to, into the industry. And uh, at that time, we... Like understood and witnessed that okay we're at that point that the community starts growing and all the companies that were participating or uh, were just starting they had their input as well and um, year from year uh, we have seen the market growing new startups uh, following the trends uh, the existing teams growing so in 2021 Getting back to your question, we understood, uh, okay, we're now solid enough as a community to come all together uh, and um, start building together. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what's happening. And talking about community, it's not just the local one. So it's Armenians in crypto 
uh, abroad globally yeah. globally for instance in the machine learning space the space where i i more come from i think the biggest part was people building their own companies that use machine learning technologies and having a lot of open jobs for for people and hence having a lot more machine learning engineers and people who work with machine learning who then go off and start their own companies and there's the catalyst effect. Um, it's the same. So talking about the companies, um, in 2021, uh, we have done um, an Armenian crypto ecosystem mapping mm -hmm. uh, because we saw, okay, we're growing too fast. We don't know everyone already. Yeah. Uh, there are new teams, new people in the market. So we need to understand what's happening now and what kind of talent do we have because there were some players and we knew what kind of product and services do they offer to um, the community and users and international market general industry and we have seen some new players by the end of 2021 we noticed that the number of companies operating in in the industry has doubled um, and they were all hiring so we did another survey to understand what kind of what do we need in terms of talent and what people are and companies are looking for and all the companies were actively hiring and it's not it, it's both engineering and uh, non tech mm -hmm. roles so they they are local companies but they are offering services to top tier companies and global some market. of them global market so we have some players that do very unique uh, stuff and very, very good quality. We have Funday offering marketing services to top tier Fab3 companies. Uh, we have A6 International, which provides customer support uh, to, again, global markets and is one of the leading companies. We have Coinstats. Yeah. Everyone knows Coinstats and I hope uses Coinstats. So it's a top portfolio tracker. And the team is growing uh, really quick and they still have yeah. the capacity for that. And we have also lots of companies who are outsourcing. Uh, this is another pattern to follow for the market because we are providing, as, as you mentioned, uh, how we can position Armenia with being good in something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't depend on any area, but Armenia is good at talent right. in any case. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's good quality, it's it's quick, it's, uh, I don't know, communication is great, yeah. uh, everything. So people feel comfortable working with um, Armenian people and people in Armenia, mm -hmm. let's say. And crypto industry is not uh, an exception. Uh, now also, uh, Noor is working with different uh, companies. We have partners and clients, and the service we provide is generally recruitment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're finding the talent for them. We are training the talent for them. It's two different areas, and they get the best of it. So right. they, they find people who are great uh, in their own domain, and they also like great engineers and they also have the benefit of fully onboard them in crypto to talk the same language. You mentioned Coinstats a little bit earlier. Uh, before I moved to Armenia, probably was around 2017, uh, I was using Coinstats, but I had no idea it was an Armenian company. And at the time, I had just sort of started discovering the tech ecosystem in Armenia. I randomly later found out that Coinstats was an Armenian company and I really started to realize just just how quickly things were growing here where I as just some random person in Canada was even using a product uh, built and developed in Armenia and that was a, a cool moment. So coming back to Noor, what are some of the other services you guys provide? Because I know you, you also do some consulting for, for blockchain companies, right? Can you tell us a bit more about that? So we, we had a long journey as an association, um, building the community, raising awareness to crypt about crypto, working with our partners uh, globally to bring the experience here, helping the teams grow, helping the academia understand what, uh, how they can position and how can they talk about technology, how can they teach uh, uh, about the technology. And uh, in 2022, uh, we changed our operations a little bit. And now Noor is a one-stop shop service provider for Web3 companies. So mainly we do consulting and advisory and we also provide services for the teams uh, who are trying to find their 
place in Web3 and enhance their product in Web3. So it's generally two, two areas. We, we covered it a little bit earlier. So if you are a Web3 startup and trying to get to the next level or you're trying to level up your team or uh, enhance the product, we can be your partner there. Um, what does that mean? So you're trying to... Uh, validate your Web3 idea for, for your product or service or solution. Um, you're trying to prepare a great pitch to start uh, reaching out the investors. Uh, you want um, a great story for your product and you do not know how to do it. And you want to package your product correctly for crypto market. And you are trying to find users. You are trying to find partners, team members, doing marketing, finding the right strategy for business development. So it, it's, it sounds a lot, but every startup needs it. And we have found the key how to do it in Web3. What's the key? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so the key is an experience mm. generally, and we uh, being in the market for quite some time, uh, we understood how the crypto user is thinking, what's the mindset, how the crypto investors are, how their brains are wired, let's say, and what they're looking into uh, when, when searching for a startup. And we have had our own experience working with the startups and um, we have the solid track record to understand do's and don'ts. And at that, standing at that place, we understand that we're ready to share and uh, we're ready to, to scale these yeah. services and going behind, beyond. Before we started the podcast, you and I were talking and you said that you guys also do idea validation. And that really interested me because, again, coming from the machine learning side, I often, sometimes people will come up to me and suggest some some problem that, that should be solved with machine learning. And o more often than not, my first thought is, why would you want to use machine learning to solve this problem? And I understand that like machine learning is a trendy technology and a lot of people just want to apply machine learning to anything. I've even seen like AI backpacks or AI wallets, like anything you can think of. And I'm sure it's the same in blockchain because blockchain is very hot and popular right now. How do you guys think about idea validation and what what are you looking for to determine whether or not this problem should be solved using blockchain? And also, or what makes blockchain a good solution to a problem? Good question. So yes, yeah. uh, you can put Web3 to an orange juice and uh, it can be <laughs> uh, marketed even even better and people will, will uh, try uh, to buy it and to be there or to try that orange yeah. juice. Uh, just joking, uh, but uh, that's that's the reality for now. Okay, NFTs, NFTs, DeFi, DeFi, yeah. put everything, uh, the, the trendy words uh, around something and... Um, everyone believes uh, it will find its way in the industry. Right. But uh, at some point, this kind of solutions or this kind of um, proposition, it dies. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and we have seen lots of uh, scams uh, also collapsing or uh, vanishing from the market. And that's the uh, normal path for them. But coming back to idea validation and generally... so. The first step will be really define the problem. So what's the problem? And um, coming uh, whether whether this problem should be solved with blockchain or not, we're trying to find the analogies. What, kind, what other technologies can solve this problem? And what would be the added value uh, if we apply blockchain to it? And we have had uh, projects who uh, started with blockchain and it was a good decision and then they because blockchain is not easy and yeah. it's um, in terms of technology itself uh, it uh, requires lots of investment and um, the development itself is not that straightforward for some of the solutions and at some point the startups they get out the blockchain component mm. and uh, decided to go without blockchain and at some point they, they get back. Mm. Uh, so it depends on um, who you target, so who is your target audience and what are you building as a solution. Um, it's not always straightforward and it's not always blockchain. So yeah. it, it depends on uh, what we're really trying to solve, for whom and when. Mm -hmm. So if we're building um, a solution that is for like web so it, it's web3 and uh, you cannot uh, think of anything else mm -hmm. 
it, it's blockchain, but if if it still uh, has its application in in Fab two, and we're, we're trying to understand whether it can be done without mm. it. I once heard uh, an entrepreneur in the blockchain space say, "If you want to solve a problem using blockchain, first ask yourself." can you solve the same problem using a classic database? And if you can, maybe you should just use a classic database. Yeah, uh, Definitely. Yeah. So <laughs> if, if you're choosing blockchain, not because it's fancy and trendy, you, you know you, you will need to work for that hard and right. for a long time because sure. it's not easy. And if you can deliver your uh, solution quicker, faster for, for the end user or the beneficiary, why not? So mm. choose, choose the technology that works. Right. Before we move on to speaking about trends and just the technology more generally, can you share with us the number of blockchain companies that you've uh, mapped out in the ecosystem in Armenia? It can be a general, like, rough estimate. If we look um, at the pattern of um, at the ecosystem now, we have around 30 companies operating. Um, so it, it, it can differ from a small startup of two or three people to uh, bigger companies of uh, 100, 150. Yes, we have this kind of numbers in crypto as well, but... Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, these companies are not maybe well exposed because they provide services to um, globally, but the outsourcing, um, yeah, outsourcing, and but marketing will do its job, I think. Mm -hmm. And talking about talent, so I mentioned I mentioned earlier that all these companies are hiring and they are hiring aggressively. So we noticed this uh, gap, let's say, uh, in the market um, starting in the beginning of 2021 or even earlier, and that's why we're targeting our courses uh, to build uh, exactly this talent. And these courses are for non-tech people, people who do want to transform their career from Web2 to, to Web3. So these courses come, come to them as a bridge. Uh, so you are a marketer or you are a content writer, and uh, you can uh, take the course, uh, we call it the blockchain challenger course and it's kind of transformation uh, gamified course and after the course you have the opportunity to find a job in web3 mm -hmm. and the opportunity is shared either by noor and our partners or we find um, other people who are looking for for talent so it's at some point it's like uh, a match so four weeks and you are there yeah. but for some people it takes some more time and uh, the same comes for engineering uh, there is a huge demand for engineering talent also there are the specific stacks tech stacks but generally people are looking for uh, this talent in Armenia and this refers to local companies who are growing and the companies that have relocated and trying to set their offices here, companies who are operating uh, globally and they're trying to find the best talent uh, in Armenia. And we're adjusting, trying to build what is needed for this talent to be ready when the time comes. Courses, trainings, onboarding trainings, uh, etc. This is one of the other areas Noor is focusing right now. And talking about our partners and the track, or track record here, we have had the chance to work with a company and to onboard more than 100 people for wow. them during a year. Uh, and you, you guys built a 100-person team for uh, a company? Yeah, so it's, it's not... Uh, it takes time, right. a year yeah. or, 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 or some a short time. time though for a yeah, people. and we have been doing trainings wow. and uh, onboardings for for these people, and we still continue doing that. That's so incredible. for for a company who who is looking for this kind of um, service or who, uh, let's say, who wants his team to perform better because they will have more context in crypto. Yeah. That's what we're trying to to solve. Yeah. Because when you understand the crypto market specifics and how your user thinks, what's the mindset and why they are doing what they do, uh, you will be able to treat your product and your solution better. And the same applies for, for your employees as a company. So they have more context, they have more knowledge, and they are able to perform better. Uh, and that's that's what we're targeting and focusing on yeah. right now. And this applies. So in many cases, companies, uh, not all the companies 
build this capacity from from scratch. So if you're a co good content writer, you will figure out how to write about crypto. But uh, at some point, you will have the challenge because yeah. you do not understand the context. You need domain knowledge. Yeah, yeah, you do not have the domain knowledge. And the added value when you do have the domain knowledge is huge. Yeah. And this applies to our team specifically as well. So we do onboardings, your functionality specific training and your domain, crypto domain knowledge specific training. So we can speak the same language yeah. That's uh, really with, impressive. with our yeah. em employees, with our partners. Yeah. And it's kind of became our routine. So mm -hmm. that's how we live. Yeah. <laughs> if you do not, uh, if you do not know about crypto, okay, we can, we can explain everything. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. What about at the university level, for instance, like you mentioned, you brought up the example of Aram Jivanyan. His work was really academic work that was then sort of commercialized, or I don't know if commercialized is the right word in the crypto context, but are you guys working on building capacity at the university levels to have more cryptography research or blockchain research done at the universities? Or? Uh, we're always open to do that. And um, we, we have the experience and we have the track record of institutions and academies who have done so in, in different countries, our partners. Yeah. But we, have, we need more ecosystem to be ready for that. Hmm. And we need to show the demand, the, the growing demand. We have been taking that role more actively and we do not stop here. So um, maybe next year we will uh, start working with um, universities again to try to understand what kind of gaps we can solve with the existing programs and how we can add the little um, secret ingredient uh, to existing programs so they, they can the graduates can be ready for the uh, global market needs. Mm -hmm. And expectations. Other than that, it's it's more on a private sector. Right. So, uh, but do you, do you think um, so? The research and scientific side of it is important to have a healthy crypto ecosystem or a blockchain ecosystem. It is research and development R and D itself. Uh, it's it's core for all the technologies to grow and for crypto and for for blockchain technology more specifically, uh, it's growing too fast. And if you do not uh, follow the yeah. the trends and what's happening. Uh, you will not be able to uh, suggest more comprehensive solutions to the market, to the industry. Uh, That's very so novel, yes, so. yeah. uh, we we definitely need it. And now the private sector solves it. Some companies they do the R and D for their domains, let's say DeFi uh, or whatever it is, NFTs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But and for more core parts, uh, again, private sector takes this on, on themselves. Right. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, shift away from from Armenia a bit. But before we do, share with us the dates for the twenty twenty three conference uh, that'll be taking place. Yeah. So Chainpoint um, back in twenty nineteen. So let 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 me give another uh, quick comment as as well. Sure. Uh, we had around five hundred people uh, coming from from different countries. Um, more than 30 countries. We had more about 50 speakers, two days, and we got feedback that the participants um, learned as much as they needed to research for two or three months. So it was, and, and uh, after the retro we did for the conference, we decided, okay, we need to build something lighter in, in terms of content, but we will still keep doing that. Uh, we had a startup battle pitching. So we had startups and investors invited. So it was uh, a great environment for themselves as well uh, to find each other or to understand if there are any matches or any synergies to continue working together. And generally, what I'm trying to say, Chainpoint is business driven. So, uh, and the market needs it. Yeah. We're trying to bring right people together, not just to network, not just to share ideas, but also build businesses right. and try to build new solutions, mm -hmm. find out what can be changed, improved, enhanced to push the market growth. Mm -hmm. And 2023 will be still about that. It will be maybe different in format, depending on the market needs and market uh, scenarios and environment at that time. We will be targeting uh, mid-2023 uh, and in more, more, yeah, in, in summer and more announcements uh, will, will come soon. 
Victoria, let's move on to speaking about sort of trends in blockchain technology and the technology in general. Um, so 2021 was a year of incredible growth for for cryptocurrencies and blockchain um, applications. And 2022 was a bit of a slump, I would say. <laughs> there was a lot of sort of big news events that really impacted the market. How would you describe the global blockchain ecosystem today? What are What's the current state of it? What problems are they working to solve? And what are the most important trends that people should know about? The most important thing, um, adoption, scaling, if we're talking about the technology. The most important pieces that have we have seen uh, growing, DeFi, DeFi markets. And after the uh, changes that we have seen in 2022, um, FTX collapse, Terra, uh, Celsius Network, um, I don't know, the other collapses, yeah. let, let's name it collapse, <laughs> <laughs> the company is going bankrupt, etc., etc. We understand that there is more uh, more need for uh, DeFi application. Explain and what adapting. DeFi is. Mm. Um, so DeFi, decentralized uh, finance, uh, as we call it, and it's a general term, uh, umbrella term for all the uh, financial solutions applications uh, that are on blockchain that, that are decentralized. So it's lending, borrowing, uh, anything that we can name, decentralized. Traditional financial services that banks and stuff would provide in the blockchain uh, context, they're referred to as DeFi. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In DeFi specifically, one of the things that was quite popular, I guess starting in 2021 maybe, and but throughout 2022 as well, until some of those big collapses, was the sort of like a, I guess, investment, but it was like a regular return-based investments uh, where you would you would put up some uh, some amount of cryptocurrency and you would get, uh, it was like a savings account, essentially, a uh, high interest, so very high interest savings account. <laughs> what are some of the DeFi applications that are working working well right now, have a lot of adoption and, and that are expected to grow? Generally, if we talk about DeFi, one of the greatest applications is Uniswap to follow. Uh, and uh, there are other protocols uh, also offering um, other solutions. What is Uniswap? Um, Uniswap is a decentralized exchange, as we know it. So it has the same functionality as the exchanges as we know it. Uh, but um, everything is on blockchain, decentralized, transparent, peer-to-peer, -peer, without intermediaries, and uh, saving you time, saving you money, and providing more flexibility in, in the services mm -hmm. that the exchange provides. It's not easy. So Web3 is not easy. And uh, that, that is another uh, challenge that uh, the whole industry is trying to solve. Because uh, Web3 is about you, yourself, remembering all the passwords, uh, uh, re understanding yeah. what needs to be done. But we do not have the uh, easy UI yeah. uh, and UX. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it's still a challenge. And there are lots of companies, teams who are trying to address and solve this uh, for most of the companies. Yeah, like, for instance, my grandparents are never going to put in the Bitcoin wallet address to send money or receive money. So you almost need like a debit card equivalent or a credit card equivalent of being able to use that cryptocurrency without having to go through the complex procedures that you go through through now, right? Yeah. Mm, I was sur surprised. <laughs> my, my grandma, so she's following me on Facebook and uh, one day she was like, uh, oh, I noticed uh, there was a kind of event. Uh, you, we, you were talking about cryptocurrencies and blockchain so please explain me right. what is that <laughs> and i've explained but she's not using right. anything yet but yet so right. she she is the community member right. enthusiast she's the grandmother of the ceo of Nord, so <laughs> yeah. Using it eventually. <laughs> yeah um any other sort of DeFi services or applications that you think people should know about i'm, I'm more curious like from a general perspective like for instance, do you think a popular form of investing, for instance, in the U.S. is investing in index funds? Do you think DeFi will take over some of those traditional uh, financial tools that and instruments that have existed for so long in, in the West? An interesting question. So actually, um, 
we already see the pattern and we already see the buy-in from investors. Uh, it's just the market is volatile. Yeah. The year of 2022, it has uh, shaken the trust a little bit because if we're looking uh, back in the um, whole growth and the rapid uh, growth of the market and the prices of um, top tokens growing, top coins growing, uh, there was a total support mm -hmm. from investors and a huge interest and trust. Uh, to, right? and trust. Yeah at least trust in the in the forecast okay this works and um, lots of people were there ready to invest and they're still there but now they're more cautious understanding okay what would be the next point uh, and what would be the next step because we're not all prepared yeah. uh, for for what is happening i had some funds uh savings in ftx and i don't i don't have them now oh i'm sorry and to hear that <laughs> <laughs> i'm not that sorry but uh this is this is a good lesson learned yeah. uh so uh we, we still have the centralized component yeah. in that and uh we should have known this yeah. kind of things can happen. There's a it, saying, it's, it's right? Different. Like if you don't have yeah. your keys, they're not your coins or something like that. Yeah. Your keys, your coins. Yeah. <laughs> your, if it's not yours, it's right. not yours. Right. Yeah. Nobody can be sorry about that because it's it's all on you. Right. It's it's your decisions. Right. Nobody's, it's your responsibility. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just uh, the general community backing some projects. Nobody knew that this kind of things will happen uh, with FTX or other big names that I've mentioned. It's just the trust and understanding what's happening and being quick. So the FTX fallout for our listeners who might not be aware of what happened. FTX was one of the largest exchanges in the world, and it went bankrupt due to fraud essentially that's alleged fraud but i think it's quite clear at this point <laughs> have you guys noticed in the ecosystem significant backlash uh, in the market from the clients of the companies that are in the ecosystem so outsourcing companies that are building blockchain applications is there less of an interest or are there much much more questions about building these applications has the has the ecosystem faced a huge backlash or withdrawal uh, we are all in crypto winter now so yeah. it's, it's it's crypto winter and it's obvious for everyone and we do not know when the spring will come <laughs> so it's february is not the end of uh, winter for crypto so, right <laughs> uh, yeah uh, but um, a good point here all the fallouts all the failures that we have seen the cause is not the failure of blockchain technology itself the technology is still there People are still building and getting to your question. People are still into it. Yeah. So we're following the technology. We're following what needs to be done for better adoption, for scaling the technology, for having more applications. And as we at Noor uh, like to say, so it's it's a build time, hmm. still a build time for everyone. And um, yes, a in crypto winter, it's 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 the same as for other financial markets. If we can look into it, it all goes down a little bit, and people are becoming more cautious yeah. in terms of investment, in terms of building something new or outsourcing some service or solution or yeah. etc. Uh, if I answer your question. And to be fair, twenty twenty two saw everything come down. It wasn't yes. just crypto. It's not just crypto. It's it's, it's all the stock market. Most of tech is down. Um, yeah, and for crypto cri maybe was down more than others, but uh, it's really just a global. The global economic situation is sort of pulling everything down, right? Yeah. If we look into statistics, um, crypto was like down twice as more than yeah. other uh, other uh, asset markets, let's right. say. Mm. But uh, we're, we're positive still um, and continuing on uh, focusing on, on building the value for end users and uh, the whole Web3 ecosystem yeah. because at some, at, at some time things will get better. Mm-hmm. And we will get to more stable state. So warmer that. times yeah. in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> Before we wrap up, I also want to ask you about NFTs. This was another thing that was very trendy in 2021. 2022, it also saw a big crash. What's the NFT space like now? Is it is it still viable and vibrant? Is there a positive future for it, do you think? Um, it's getting stable. It's not uh, skyrocketing, let's say, as it was uh, back in 2021 
uh, summer uh, autumn but the general uh, scenario has changed so uh, we still have the new products uh, the new projects dropping new um, nfts minting so we still have the pace it's not that but um, it the uh, buyers users and general people who are involved they are getting more advice on how how do things what projects to follow and why and nfts I, I'm just uh, recalling, I have done, I don't know, five or six or even more um, uh, meetups or seminars on NFTs and yeah. it, it were different communities. We talked about NFTs with people who do not know anything tech. So they were art people, yeah. Creative Armenia. They had a project and they had a couple of teams who were uh, trying to work on NFT projects. So we did a kind of workshop with them and they still have the interest and they have lots of ideas on, oh, what can be done different, but what can be done more. And um, totally tech people who are looking uh, on NFTs, okay, what is this as a technology? Because it is a technology and uh, we still have lots of opportunities to find out how it can be leveraged better to give more more value to the community itself. And for, for other people, it's just a way of earn more money uh, or to be a part of some community, to be a part of the board apes. So right. we know the story. I, there is a huge social social component there. It's about people belonging to some community, community. and you're ready to do anything. And the, the NFT became a good tool to, to do this. Yeah. I really love NFTs. Uh, it helps lots of people who didn't know about crypto, about blockchain. It made them get into the space. Yeah. And it was a good adoption tool, let's say, because lots of people, oh, I need this NFT. I want to understand what is NFT. And they are getting step by step NFT, Web3, crypto, blockchain, and, and they become learners. Mm -hmm. and they become part of the community. What's your favorite NFT project right now? Uh, I really loved um, Azuki still. And um, okay, I'm, I'm saying that publicly, I do not get CryptoPunks and all that. <laughs> understand the value and, and I understand, uh, but it doesn't resonate with me, let's I say. I don't get it either. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, yeah Azuki um, and... There are lots of, and I also like the art pieces uh, themselves. So digital artists using yeah. NFTs as one of the areas or opportunities to express themselves. And th that was game changing as well. And also all the applications in gaming. I'm not a gamer, but I really like people who, who do and have passion for that. And uh, this changed their lives as well. Mm -hmm. So all this uh, tokenization uh, of game elements and everything gives an opportunity for monetization or uh, like revisiting the whole structure of gaming itself. Right. One of the things that was really interesting to me with NFTs was that at the beginning when I first found out about it, when they started to become extremely valuable, one of the things that was shocking to me was that it felt very anti-digital culture. Like digital culture has always been centered around ownership doesn't really matter. Uh, and maybe that's not, that's definitely not fair to creators. But, you know, if you have some file, whether it's music or a movie or something, the ability to rapidly share it was a, such a core part of like early internet culture, early digital culture, that NFTs seem to really go against all of that. But then what, what got me, I, I'm still, the, in, in my opinion, the jury is still out on NFTs. But the thing that is interesting is this community aspect that gets built around NFTs. So, it's not just the JPEG of the monkey or, or whatever, but it's like if you have the right JPEG <laughs> or the NFT, then you're a part of this this thing that other people, only other people who also have unique NFTs can be a part of. So I think it's a really interesting application for any type of like membership, um, even like wineries or um, season tickets to like hockey teams or basketball teams and stuff. In that aspect, I think there's a lot of interesting applications that we'll see. We'll see down the line. Uh, loyalty programs. Loyalty programs. Anything. Yeah, uh, yeah lo lots of lots yeah. of uh, applications. And going back to ownership and everything, NFT communities they have their own ethics. Yeah. 
yeah and um, those kind of things make sense yeah i don't know i i have uh, friends artists photographers and it was always challenging for them to give out to yeah. give out uh, their uh, work art pieces yeah and now they have the technology that can uh, secure right. the whole path for them yeah. or make it safe uh, because you you sell a, a, a painting or you sell a picture and it's it's gone right. now you can track the whole uh, whole journey and, and all transactions you can even know who are the owners yeah. and uh, and you are still the one uh, owning it right. owning the creation of it right um, and it's beautiful. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people, when they think about it in the context of art, it's hard to to grasp it. Maybe because they don't like art or they've never been interested enough in art to to own like a, an original piece. But for instance, if someone's like a very passionate writer, like someone's really into writing, um, their favorite author or something, like it would be cool to have the original Word document or Google Doc that that person actually used to write the book or the that article, that very famous article or something? Um. Mm, there are already existing projects for not, not art, but uh, content writers, yeah. writers, uh, uh, that, that kind of creators. Yeah. Uh, one project, Mirror, it, it's doing the same. So you, you can track all the process, you can vote for each piece and mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful as well. So and um, the other thing, the demonetization piece and royalties. So uh, for for the creators themselves, uh, it's it's a huge added value yeah. uh, to get royalty from, from each transaction mm -hmm. um, and li lifetime income, passive right. income. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and another important, so it's all we talk, it's about utilities. Uh, what kind of NFTs? Uh, yes, it uh, it uh, represents ownership, but also uh, it brings some kind of utility with yeah. with it. Yeah. Uh, all the memberships and everything that we mentioned during one of the um, seminars, uh, we talked about Gary Vaynerchuk, mm -hmm. and he's he has a couple of Gary friends yeah. uh, projects it's like collection. His that he yeah, took, it's yeah. it's um, I don't know. It is there and it, it is popular because it's Gary Vaynerchuk. Right, yeah. But all the pieces, they provide real utility and yeah. real value. So if I'm someone who uh, needs uh, any kind of service or any kind of uh, interaction with Gary himself, uh, it's game changing. It's yeah. life changing for me. So yeah. why not? Yeah. And, it's, it's a, and NFTs are a good tool. Uh, to do it uh, smoothly and mm -hmm. beautifully. I don't know. Yeah, it's the utility aspect that people need to keep in mind when thinking about the yeah. value of NFTs. Yeah. In the beginning of, of 2022, we had lots of uh, people coming with, oh, I need, and getting back to idea validation piece. We definitely need to do NFTs out of these pieces. Yeah. Uh, and all beautiful projects, all beautiful concepts, and we worked uh, to get to the stage, okay, this is the problem we're solving, this is mm -hmm. the community we're addressing, but all these projects, they require uh, hard work, day, mm -hmm. night and day, and also huge input on from marketing side. Mm -hmm. uh, all the projects, they get successful because the marketing is done correctly mm -hmm. and the community, the target community is chosen correctly and they have a story behind them. So it's not just pieces, even crypto punks. So it's not just JPEGs and it's not just uh, the uh, pictures that we see. They have a story that right. they are telling and you become a backer or a supporter of a story from from start. Yeah. It has its life. Right. Uh, yeah, and you're part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another trend that we heard a lot about was Web3 and Metaverse, uh, sort of Web3 applications in the Metaverse. Is that something that's uh, being actively pushed still? Or? Yeah, it is. So Web3 is an umbrella, a general term uh, for describing anything, the ecosystem, the decentralized ecosystem, everything that uh, operates on blockchain with cryptocurrencies, etc. So Web3 is kind of an umbrella an umbrella for this and we heard we hear about DeFi, we hear about nfts DAOs, and metaverse so metaverse fits into that uh yeah okay i don't know that um so it's, it's kind of they're re co correlated right. uh, let's say yeah metaverses um we have some applications metaverse uh 
uh, decentralized metaverses, let's say. Mm. Um, uh, Decentraland, sandbox, so what is that about uh, pieces of lands as NFTs sold for huge amount of money? In the metaverse. In the metaverse, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for uh, what I imagine, okay, in, at some point you will be able to furnish that piece, right. build a house there. Like uh, the couch will be an NFT. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you will be able to put your NFTs on the walls right. as, as an art pieces. Right. What, what we're seeing when I was looking at uh, the uh, data stats and these projects are not, they do not have that much active users. So very wealthy people have, I don't, not even wealthy or people who understand the technology, they have secured their uh, Land. lands uh, <laughs> at this project yeah. just in case right. for some time. <laughs> and they there are also metaverses as we hear for some context it's not fully decentralized mm -hmm. so uh, i think you you were mentioning that piece because we have oh metaverses growing it's not only um it's about mixing the technologies together so it's virtual reality or yeah. augmented reality and uh, some applications of um, other technologies mm -hmm. and um, and crypto and blockchain right. as as backing technology here, right. it's getting active and everybody talks about it. For some applications, like let's say education, um, for people uh, who do not have access to it, mm -hmm. so metaverse classrooms in metaverses that can become again life changing for mm -hmm. people who can like sit um in the same room with other people like kind of class have the classroom and have their lesson yeah. uh, and and for disabled people also and, and there are lots of different ap areas and applications so it depends how we use this technology yeah okay interesting and victoria our last question uh, i usually ask it in one part but i'm going to split it up into three what do you hope to see in the coming 5 to 10 years for Noor, um, for blockchain generally, and for the ecosystem in Armenia? Um, I'll start from the last one. Okay. So uh, for Armenian ecosystem, uh, I would really like to see more products going global and more teams growing here, building the solution from scratch. So mm -hmm. becoming from outsourcing, uh, more of building country product companies uh, having more product companies even even if it's service so providing service from from armenia uh, and building products here for global markets and uh, taking um, not only following the trends but setting some trends mm. so that's kind of a wish and a goal it can be a goal yeah. if we put the right resources together and if we bring all the stakeholders together mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, for blockchain technology as it is, so more adoption, more people understanding uh, the importance of the technology and more buy-in from institutions, governments, the stakeholders and decision makers who 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 set the trends and who can uh, who are the change makers and uh, let's put it that way who have the tools now to change something yeah. because. Um, the technology, it it will find its way, but when you have the buy-in from the stakeholders who who is um, in charge of the change globally in the countries, in regions, mm -hmm. it it will get more adoption, more quicker, let's say, mm -hmm. faster. For Noor, so in in five ten uh, years, uh, it it's too much actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll try to target five. Um, so I see us growing big and I, I see us acquiring new markets because we're going global already and um, I would like to see us uh, providing more value to the community and uh, not, not, not locally, not regionally, but uh, globally. And um, I would like to see us also building our own products mm. because for now I haven't mentioned um, as a spin-off, uh, we have CoinPlus and um, Vigen Aroshanyan, um, he's the CEO and founder of, of CoinPlus. It's a, a crypto wallet. And I would like to see more uh, this kind of products uh, built uh, by Noor team. Incredible. 
Victoria, thank you so much. I think I personally learned a lot from the from the conversation. I think our listeners will have as well. I think you really demystified a lot of what is going on in, in blockchain. And I personally really enjoyed hearing about uh, the ecosystem building part that, that you guys are involved in. Um, this is a super fast, quickly evolving space. So we'll have you back on again sometime in the future, I hope, to, to share the updates with us. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thanks for having me today.